All right. So I have collected summas. Meredith, you missed yesterday, and I already have your summa in my email. Um, so I told you about this. I think I told you about this last week. I don't remember. This class has another week, you know? Um, so I am going to record class next week, which will be our reading of the Eumenides and just this time, home, home, hold on. But it's just going to be, I'm going to record it and post it on YouTube. So I would really, I implore you, and an email has already been sent to your parents. The weekly email has this on there. Get on YouTube next week and just, you can give me an hour and a half of your Christmas vacation. You can do that. Yeah, that's how long class is. You can wear your jammies. You can sip cocoa. All right. But it will be the end of our discussion of this trilogy. And I will introduce to you the lovely festive play you're going to read over Christmas vacation, which is Oedipus the King. Not festive at all, actually. Um, we are also, I was trying to figure out how to make this work, and I just decided that, you know what, today is what, December the 8th? You guys do not need a total break between now and the beginning of January. You just, you just don't. No, you don't. you don't. I say you don't. So we are going to begin a paper. All right, you're going, to work, you're going to be working on a paper. Now, obviously, you could do this paper in the next two weeks and still have a week and a half left, you know, or, uh, you know, half a week before Christmas. Don't look at me like that. <laughs> like I'm the Wicked Witch of the West or something. I'm the Grinch. Well, I need three and a half weeks in order to go through the Grinch. I need Well, I will, t I will tell you. Well, actually, I will, no, I will tell you in a minute. Um, I was... I was trying to think, oh, you know, maybe I should not make them write, but you guys, you guys can write something for me. You guys can write something for me. Honestly, it's two and a half weeks until Christmas. You could, I don't think there's anyone in here that couldn't do the whole paper within the next week. Do you know what I mean? And you don't have to email it to me. You can, you don't have to do it. You know, just bring it in January. It's fine. All right. But I will, I will explain more. It's not something you haven't done before. All right? It's all right. If you want to email it, fine. OK, Art, where have you been? Yes, I've been saying. No, you said it's something you haven't done before. Oh, oh. No, I mean, the st it's one of the six paragraph essays. OK, so our Art of the Week is actually a photograph that I got to take in the National Archaeological Museum in Athens. It, and he has a loincloth. He's the loincloth man. Aren't you happy? He's a little, a little festive. This is um, a statue. And we don't know whether it's Poseidon or Zeus. And the reason is because the thing he was flinging is gone. If he was flinging a trident, yes. And if he was flinging a thunderbolt, there you go. So we don't know. So in art books, if you look him up, you know, online or in a book, it will sometimes say Zeus, sometimes say Poseidon, sometimes it will say one, and then the other will be in parentheses. We just don't know who this was. But, and I don't, I'm think, I wonder why they decided he's a god at all. Maybe it's the beard and the hairstyle, don't know. This statue is made of bronze. And this is not the only bronze statue that we're going to look at. If you've ever read about casting things in bronze, you know, like casting a bell in metal, they would make a clay statue, okay? And then they would cover it with wax and then cover it, that with clay. And then you melt the wax out from inside and you pour the molten metal in. So you've got this mold made, and then you take away the clay, and you're left. This amazes me that anybody ever thought this process up and how they make it work. It continues to amaze me. They did it in pieces, not one whole guy. 
that would be really hard. Yes. That is so cool. And then the hardest part is you have to break all the Oh, yes. But it's, it's, it amazes me. The whole process amazes me. And then after they get the finished product out, then they would use, you know, smaller tools to etch in the details. So fingernails or eyes, what, what have you. Um, this bronze statue is from the time period right after the Persian Wars, 460 to 450 BC. The time when, as you were reading, Themistocles got sent away from Athens and ran off to live with the king of Persia, shockingly. That's when the statue was made. But in some fashion, the ship it was on being shipped to who knows where sank. It sank off Cape Artemision, the place where the fleets had met. This is the place where Themistocles had them scratch the message to the Ionians on the rocks. Please desert from Persia. Please come over to our side. Don't fight against fellow Greeks. Off that cape. And they found it in a shipwreck at the bottom of the, of the sea. And now we have it, uh, which I think is pretty cool. It's, we've come a long way from our Kouros from the guy with his hands at his sides and one foot in front of the other. In fact, this, look, think about what you do when you throw something, you know? And what, you lift your heel up, right? In that motion to put yourself forward, you lift your heel up, he's lifting his heel up. He's in the act of flinging trident slash thunderbolt whatever, which is pretty amazing to do this in bronze. Um, I will, if you want to take a closer look at him. And while you're waiting for the closer look, we can turn to page, I don't know. Let's start with the Mysticles on page uh, what is that, 64. Of this reading guide, not of Plutarch. So I need to make sure I'm clear. Um, so we read about two guys. We met both of them in Herodotus. Are we with me, ladies and gents? Oh. oh. Uh -huh. This should be your, your, your homework. You should craft a trident and a thunderbolt out of some material and then practice what, how you would have to hold, how would you hold each? And then you could, you could probably get a federal grant and write a paper on it and decide once and for all whether this is Zeus or Poseidon. Or you can just, I don't know, carry a mop. Or you could just carry a mop. That would be the, the low budget version of this of this experiment. Yes. Yes. But the point is, is it spear slash trident or thunderbolts? Anyway, we're not going to be able to solve this this. Uh, no, that is not what your paper's on. That'd be kind of fun though. Um, so we met Themistocles and Aristides both in Herodotus and contemporaries who were really, really different sorts of people. Um, and I asked you a very open-ended question. I asked you to describe the character of Themistocles. What kind of guy is he? Okay, so I think, 
I think we know why you say he's smart. Why coward? But did he have an alter? Did he have another motive as well? Are we talking about at Salamis? When, but he wanted the he wanted the Persians to encircle them so that the Greeks would not run away and they would have to fight. And I guess I guess we don't know which is foremost in his mind. I always read it that foremost in his mind was he wanted the Persians to encircle them so that they couldn't run off to Corinth and build their wall. But we don't know his mind, do we? Plutarch doesn't know his mind either. And it could be, uh, you know, Simeon Carson. So. It's bad to have in a row. It's very bad. Um, he could have had that in his mind all along. He did go and do it again, too, didn't he? he Oh, Xerxes, remember me, I'm the one who didn't let them break down the, the bridge, which was not true. Um, did you have something? No, oh, yeah, I was just going to say, um, from you, I just got your quote from you. Mm -hmm. From you, he was a vehement and insufficient nature, a quick apprehension and a strong and aspiring sense of action and affairs. Okay. Yeah, very interesting. I've got, I've got that part underlined in my book. From his youth, vehement and impetuous. What do we know? What vehement means? Forceful, strong, strong emotions. What does it mean to be impetuous? That is a really good guess. It's not true, but I. It means rash, acting sometimes before you think it all through. Yes, but it doesn't have a good connotation. Spontaneous sounds like a good thing. Impetuous sounds like a not always the best thing. He does things, he gets an idea and he just acts on it. Fortunately for the Mystocles, a lot of his sudden ideas are pretty good ideas. Alex. Oh, no, please, go ahead. Yes. Well, um, I thought, I mean, he was, he, he was a smart guy, even the book says so, but he was willing to use others to his own. He was rash and, um, he was rash and selfish, um, pretty much fighting for himself, or else he would have talked it out instead of going straight to the person. Mm, mm hmm He's, he certainly had an eye out for his own advantage, definitely. Yeah. Remember the story where he took a 30-talent bribe to, um, yeah. to keep the fleet at Artemision, and he gave five to one guy and three to the other guy, and he pocketed the other 22. <laughs> and each of the other guys he bribed was like, ooh, I've given, given a fortune by Themistocles. I bet, I bet the Athenians gave him that money just to keep us here. It's like, no. That was a bribe to me, and I just pocketed 22 talents of silver. Oh, my goodness. I don't know. That, I was being oh, metaphorical. <laughs> Here, guys, Alex is continuing his description. Hey, guys, guys. <laughs> yes. Especially when fighting for himself. Very, very active. Um, so, let me go on and read some more after the part that Matthew quoted. Um, the holidays and intervals in his studies he did not spend in play or idleness as the other children, but would always be inventing or arranging some oration or declamation to himself, the subject of which was generally the excusing or accusing his companions. 
so that his master would often say to him, you, my boy, will be nothing small, but great, one way or other, for good or else for bad. Uh, what you're gonna turn into, but it's gonna be something. Hope it's good. Uh, I was just gonna mention, see, see, the Mystocles writes papers on his Christmas vacation. Don't you want to be like the Mystocles? Um, Miltiades, there's a quote that Plutarch tells us, Miltiades, remember, was the hero of the Battle of Marathon. And uh, after this, Miltiades, until he, the Athenians loved him until they stopped loving him, you know, until he attacked that sacred precinct and hurt his leg and then they brought him in on a cot to find him and then his leg went gangrenous and he died. Up until then, they really liked him. And it says, um, Miltiades being everywhere talked about. I'm on page 148. It's, it's hard to tell you where I am, like a little below half. Miltiades being everywhere talked about. He was observed to be thoughtful and reserved, alone by himself. He passed the nights without sleep and avoided all his usual places of recreation. And to those who wondered at the change and inquired the reason of it, he gave the answer that the trophy of Miltiades would not let him sleep. What does he mean? The trophy of Miltiades will not let me sleep. He is bothered. What is he bothered by? What's it to him if Miltiades gets famous in glory? Yeah. Like, what about me? I want to be greater than Miltiades. I want honors. I want glory and fame. Is, this is just something that occurred to me. Is glory and fame a, a finite resource? Do you know, does the world run out of it? If someone else has more, do you get less? Okay. That's a, that's an interesting. That's an interesting point. It's like the Incredibles. If we're all super, no one would be. I use that a lot. It's a very good point. That's that's very interesting. That's very interesting because I was going for the opposite. Like, no, there's plenty of fame and glory to go around, but I suppose you guys make a really good point. Maybe there's not. Okay, so that's a different question, isn't it? How much we should we value it? Here, just a second, let Carson and then you cut. It gets passed. If somebody gets more fame and more glory, it means someone or everyone else is losing. Okay. Yes. I agree with that. Would everybody agree with that? I think I like I like that assessment. Kyle? Here's a second. Let him finish. Let him finish. This makes me wonder, though, is fame and glory a, a, a thing we can quantify, like a number, or is it relative? Like, are you famous compared to others? Okay. 
Ethan's, Ethan's going to have, he's going to blow a gasket. I think the, mis the Mystocles would be thinking from the people. If we, t if we take it back to, to the specific case we're looking at, then it would be political. Political, political fame and glory in his case. Yeah. <laughs> this is very true. So is the Mystocles worried about the attention that Miltiades is getting? And that it's not, it's not that he's using up a resource of fame and glory, but attention is being diverted from Themistocles' plans, from Themistocles' charisma, whatever he has. And he obviously has some level of charisma about him, some attractiveness, you know, that he's able to persuade people to go his way. Maybe he's afraid it's being diverted to Miltiades. That was, that was lovely. How interesting. And you guys changed my view of fame and glory as being finite or infinite resource. Thank you. Um, Themistocles is said to have been eager in the acquisition of riches, Plutarch tells us. I think we already found that out about him with the whole 22 talents of silver that he netted from the whole bribery scheme. Um, he went beyond all men in the passion for distinction. What he does want, he want, because that's what distinction means, right? If we, something is distinct from something else, we recognize it as separate and we focus our attention just on that thing. He does want to be recognized, and I suppose, and that goes back to the attention, right? If attention is swerving and it's going to this person, it's swerving off of me that I want to be a person of distinction. Um, see what else I underlined here are things that he mentioned. Um, I, let's just hit, no, no, I didn't ask that question. Um, but I asked this question about someone else, I think. Did, does Plutarch seem to like or approve of Themistocles? Does he, does he seem disapproving or does he just seem to state the facts or does he seem positively maybe praising of him in any way? What do you think, Kyle, do you have an opinion? Or are you just stretching? That's fine. Mm. 
And, and he liked money. I, I like that. We, we note that Plutarch definitely, because we would take those as negatives. I feel like most of us would take inordinate desire for fame, glory, distinction, and riches as negatives. I'm not sure that Plutarch would have taken them all as negatives. Do you know what I mean? In, in his world from a pagan perspective, Plutarch is living after Jesus, but Plutarch is not a Christian. Okay, so he's not, he's not, you know, actually he's lived in what, 120, 130 AD. So he's writing these, because he writes the life of Julius Caesar, and the right, so he wrote a lot of lives. Um, so he's writing these long after the fact. So I'm not sure that he would have thought that was a negative thing. Um, but but this, I like that assessment. He, he tells the good, the bad, and the ugly sort of about Themistocles. Here's, I thought this was an interesting section. This is on page 159. He was indeed by nature a great lover of honor, as is evident from the anecdotes recorded of him. When chosen admiral by the Athenians, he would not quite conclude any single matter of business, either public or private, but deferred all till the day they were to set sail, that by dispatching a great quantity of business all at once and having a, to meet a great variety of people, he might make an appearance of greatness and power. So he had a lot to do, but he doesn't do it. It's like you have a lot of homework, but you don't do it. You wait until the day before school late, and then you work really hard, and so your mom looks at you and she's like, Oh, you're so diligent and such a hard worker. It's like, no, actually, I just waited to do everything today so I would look like I was diligent and a hard worker. Not that you would ever, ever do that. Um, but that's what he did. Before there was a mission to go on, he would just wait. And so that the day before, he would look really busy. Oh, I have lots of meetings. I have a full social schedule and meeting schedule today. But it was, I mean, he did have things to do, but it was also a little bit of an act. You know, look at me. Look how important I am. I am so busy and all these people want to talk to me. It's very smart. Okay. Viewing the dead bodies cast up by the sea, which I assume is after, you know, from shipwrecks off Artemisian. Uh, possibly at Salamis. I'm on page 159 still. I'm on, the, I just kind of, that first, that big paragraph, but in part way, and it's off to the left, you say viewing. Viewing the dead bodies cast up by the sea, he perceived bracelets and necklaces of gold about them, yet passed on, only showing them to a friend that followed him, saying, Take you these things, for you are not Themistocles. You, you can, that is kind of a jerk statement. You, you can take these things. Uh, I'm above that sort of thing. I don't plunder, I don't plunder bodies. You just, yes, you take it. You are not Themistocles. Yeah. Okay. He said to Antiphates, a handsome young man who had formerly avoided, but now in his glory courted him, time, young man, has taught us both a lesson. You used to shun me, and I used to think you were a jerk for shunning me. Now you're looking for my favor, and I think more highly of you because you are looking for my favor. We've both learned a lesson. Uh, I'm skipping down a little bit. When the Seriphian, this is a very famous story about Themistocles. When the Seriphian told him that he had not obtained this honor by himself, but by the greatness of his city. Themistocles, you're not famous because you're great. You're famous because of Athens. Told him that, you know, it, it, it's your city that made you. He replied, you speak the truth. I should never have been famous if I had been of Seraphis, nor you if you had been of Athens. If we traded places, yeah, maybe I wouldn't have been famous if I'd been born on your island. But if you'd been born in Athens, you still wouldn't be famous. The city wouldn't have helped you at all. Kind of a little dig. Um, he's, he, 
Jenner. He is. He is. Um, <laughs> uh, laughing at his own son, I'll read one more of these, who got his mother and by his mother's means his father also to indulge him. He told him that he had the most power of anyone in Greece. For the Athenians command the rest of Greece, and I command the Athenians. Your mother commands me and you command your mother. <laughs> so you must be the top of the heap. Oh, I, got I said one more, but I lied. Loving to be singular in all things, when he had land to sell, he ordered the crier to give notice that there were good neighbors near it. It's like if you are selling the vacant lot next to you and you post it on there, oh, FYI, this property has good neighbors and you're the neighbor. What is going on? I, think, I feel like there's a conversation going on that's not about Themistocles somehow. Um, so Plutarch also tells us this on page 151. He was the chief means of the deliverance of Greece and gained the Athenians the glory of alike surpassing their enemies in valor and their confederates in wisdom. You know what? He might have been a jerk sometimes. And he might have been a little full of himself, but the man saved Greece. So says Plutarch. Um, which brings him into conflict with Aristides, the guy who is not like him. I want to read, before we look at the Aristides life, I want to read this though. Um, it says on page 148. Aristides was of a mild nature and of a nobler sort of character, and in public matters acting always with a view not to glory or popularity, but to the best interest of the state, consistently with safety and honesty. He was forced to oppose Themistocles and interfere against the increase of his influence, seeing him stirring up the people to all kinds of enterprises and introducing various innovations. He's impetuous. And so Aristides versus Themistocles in that round, Aristides lost. And Themistocles, Plutarch suggests possibly by lying, Themistocles spreading lies about Aristides, got him ostracized. And it turned out to be a good thing for Greece that he did it. I hate to say that. The Mysticles had the right idea of how to save them against the Persians. And Aristides didn't have the right idea. Um, so I asked you, where does the Mysticles, what did I say? Where did he end his life? How and why did he end it? Yeah, Matthew. Persia in the city of Magnesia. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes. So you know what I found out? Somebody yesterday, this was a, actually a good use of their phone and the uh, Wikipedia or whatever. He looked up bull's blood. Apparently there is, was a, in the ancient world a poison that was called bull's blood. It isn't actually bull's blood. It was used as a medication, but obviously in too strong a dose, it was fatal. I don't think, I think maybe it's not literal blood. I think there is a poison called bull's blood. I did not know this until yesterday. And I'm only trusting one of my students and his phone. So don't take this as a sure thing. Um, yeah. Yes, well, then I can't be wrong, ever. Um, yeah, he, do you remember Herodotus? Like, oh, we're trying to forget, no. Um, several times it was mentioned the idea of lopping off the ones who get too tall. Do you remember the guy who wanted advice about ruling and he just took the guy at messenger in a field and he just took his scythe and he lopped off the heads of grain that were growing above the rest. And he went home and he's like, you didn't tell me anything. You just did this. And the guy who sent him said, oh, I know exactly what he's telling you to do. Athens did that. You know, so 
I'm sorry. That's the X-Files theme coming from my phone. Yes, that's my ring. No, but I'll make it stop. It's somebody I don't know. Yeah. I like the X-Files. Okay. So, and it's never the same as anybody else's, you know, if I'm in a store and I hear the X-Files theme. And it makes my life seem more exciting. Like at any moment, aliens might land or I might be involved in a supernatural conspiracy. Okay. It hasn't happened yet, though. Um, that I know of. Um, now, what was I saying? Oh, about lopping off the heads that get too tall. Uh, the Athenian people did this. Ostracism, in fact, I'm not going to take the time to find the place in Plutarch, but he tells us this was a tool not to punish anybody because they broke the law, but to keep people from getting, anyone from getting too strong, too powerful. And so when Aristides, you know, was, his power was rivaling Themistocles, he gets lopped. When Themistocles, in his turn, gets too powerful, he gets lopped. And he runs off to Persia, and we have this lovely story that Xerxes was so happy that he woke up, or, or he, in his sleep, he cried out three times, I have Themistocles the Athenian. With great hubris, Themistocles receives the 200 talent reward for bringing in Themistocles, because he brought in himself. Reward money. I think actually it says Xerxes offered it to him, but it doesn't say he didn't take it. And, and so they set him up royally. They gave him cities. They gave him land. They treated him like a king. And so he said, Plutarch tells this story that he's sitting at the table with his wife and children. And he says, children, we would have been undone if we had not been undone. If things hadn't gone poorly for us in Athens, we wouldn't be sitting here in the lap of luxury right now. But, as Matthew told us, Themistocles had a line he wouldn't cross, and it was fighting against his own country. And when Egypt was rebelling and the Greeks were helping, and Xerxes planned a, an expedition against the Greeks that were helping Egypt. Themistocles like, no, I can't do that. And Plutarch, he does have morals. He says, um, chiefly being ashamed to sully the glory of his former great actions and of his many victories and trophies. He no determined to put a conclusion to his life. So yes, in a sense, I guess his, his suicide was selfish in the sense that I don't want to make myself look bad by joining the king. So, now you're making me sad, Alex, because I was admiring him, and now you just, just burst that bubble. Because now I'm seeing, oh, yeah, you'll take Xerxes' gifts and all his stuff, but when he asks you to do something for him, you just kill yourself and you won't do it. Thanks so much for that. I was admiring him up until that moment. Um, no, I, I don't totally agree with you. It was a selfish act. Um, he would not fight against his fellow countrymen. Which takes us to Aristides. Aristides the Just. And I asked you, and I think we've kind of answered this already, how did his character differ from that of Themistocles? Does anyone want to tell me what you put for that? Well, I will find Aristides in my book. Yes? Oh, um, where Themistocles <clears throat> was rash and selfish, Aristides seemed to be more centered on honor and justice good for everyone else putting them before Yes. It's the exact opposite of it. I think you can tell that I like how this thing is a lot. Yeah, well. So he, he, he thought, uh, he, he didn't think uh, on his feet as much more as the mystic things. Mm -hmm. He liked to think about it and 
get everyone's opinion on it. So he was really more of an Athenian than Stiglitz mm. mm -hmm. was. He was more democratic than all of that. Themistocles could have been a Pisistratus. Yeah. You know what I mean? The guy who paid the six foot tall, beautiful woman to be a thing in. That's really what we're looking for. <laughs> but, um, so, he was a little more level headed and slower to act, but he considered things before he did it. Mm -hmm. And that's. Uh, here's, here's what Plutarch says. Um, some say that being boys and bred up together from their infancy, they were always at variance with each other and in all their words and actions, as well serious as playful, and that in this their early contention, they soon made proof of their natural inclinations. The one being ready, adventurous, and subtle, engaging readily and eagerly in everything. The other of a staid, and settled temper intent on the exercise of justice, not admitting any degree of falsity, indecorum, or trickery. No, not so much as at his play. Um, very, two very different types of character. Um, Themistocles, in, in the life of Themistocles, Plutarch tells us a story about after the Persians leave, Themistocles tells the people, I have a great plan, and if you will do my plan, um, I, we can be the strongest city in Greece. And the people said, well, you tell it to Aristides. Tell him, and we'll trust his judgment. Because Themistocles, I don't want to tell you what the plan is, but after I do it, you'll thank me, because we'll be the strongest in Greece. So we'll tell it to Aristides. His plan was to burn the rest of the Greek fleet. See why he didn't tell them. So only Athens would have a fleet. Because they were all in one place. It's like, I can take out all the other Greek ships, and we are it. So, and Aristides came back to the people, and he said, he said, Themistocles' plan, okay, I'm paraphrasing. Themistocles' plan is politically very savvy, but it's also extremely dishonorable. And the people trusted Aristides, like, then don't do it. Whatever it is, politically savvy, great. Don't like, disgraceful, whatever word I just, dishonorable. <laughs> Remember the word I just used, don't do it. Uh, Aristides walked, so to say, alone on his own path in politics, being unwilling in the first place to go along with his associates in ill-doing. I don't want to join other people in the things they're doing wrong. Or to cause them vexation by not gratifying their wishes. You know, they're going to be ticked off with me if I don't join them, and if I do join them, I'll be as wicked as they are. It's a lose-lose situation. Secondly, observing that many were encouraged by the support they had in their friends to act injuriously, he was cautious. You know, sometimes when you make friends with the wrong people, they can get you to do things you ought not to do. You've got to be careful who your friends are. Being of opinion that the integrity of his words and actions was the only right security for a good citizen. Jim, did we talk about what it means to have integrity? That, are you guys the ones I talked to about that? Yeah. To be able to do the right thing, even no one is looking at you. Even if you could get away with it, to not do it, to be wrong. Okay, great. Yeah, so integer. An integer in math is what? So in integer, in math, you can graph an integer. Whole. Yeah, let's go with the whole. So if you have integrity, your whole person is one unified whole. You're not in parts. You don't act this way at this time when people are looking, and then you act this way another time when people are not looking. You're a whole. You're not pretending or acting. Not like the Hippocrates, the actors, right? Who are acting part of the time. And you never know when. Aristides wasn't an actor. 
He had integrity. He was always the same to everyone. Themistocles, I'm not saying Themistocles was a hypocrite, but I am saying that I get the sense that Themistocles was willing to bend who he was depending on who he was around, maybe, to get the job done. Um, I love this. This sums it up. Once when judging between two private persons, on the one declaring his adversary had very much injured Aristides. So two people are at court. Aristides is the judge. And one says to Aristides, you know, he, he said bad things about you. He did nasty things to you, Aristides. Tell me rather, good friend, he said, what wrong he has done you. For it is your cause, not my own, which I sit in judge of. Don't come tell me what he did to me. Tell me what he did to you. That's the case in point. I don't care what he did to me. So I asked you. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I cut you off. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, why does Plutarch, this is on page 439, why does Plutarch think that being known for justice is better than being known for power or dominion. Do you think? Yes. And he died for it. He died for what he believed was just. Okay, that's very good. Anybody else have an observation? Yeah, Matthew. Okay, I agree with both of these things, and we'll t I agree with both of these things. Let's take it one step even above. This is what actually Plutarch says, and it's kind of between, you have to read between the lines in this a little bit. I'm not going to read this whole thing. Um, Although the divinity to whom they desire to compare and assimilate themselves excels, it is supposed, in three things, immortality, power, and virtue of which three, the noblest and divinest, is virtue. For the elements and vacuum have an everlasting existence. Earthquakes, thunders, storms, and torrents have great power. I'm going to stop there for a minute. The natural elements have power. The, the, from his pagan Greek perspective, the, the universe, you know, has dominion. The elements have dominion. What rules over all of us in a materialistic universe? The material, right? Earthquakes are strong. Volcanoes are strong. These all have power. In, but in justice and equity, nothing participates except by means of reason and the knowledge of that which is divine. The, so anybody, anybody can be powerful. Volcanoes can be powerful. You know, non-sentient things can be powerful. Animals, beasts, can have dominion over other beasts and, and, and be powerful over them. But the only thing that can be just or virtuous is something with reason. And what is reason? It's the part of us that is created in the image of God. I'm putting words in Plutarch's mouth now. But that, that's the part that participates, well, participates in the divine, okay? Because it sets us apart, which is you were you were basically is what you were saying. You were skirting around that. 
That's what Plutarch, what Plutarch, why he thinks this makes it the height of what we should pursue. And this is in a world, just like our world, where a lot of people thought that power, okay, Themistocles, maybe, power, fame, glory, was it. But lots of things or creatures could have power and glory. But justice or virtue is something only we, animals aren't virtuous, right? They don't, you know, the lion doesn't say, oh, I'm gonna, I don't know, that gazelle has a family. I'm gonna not eat that gazelle. That, that gazelle, I don't know, that gazelle's been up to no good. I feel like taking that gazelle out is just not gonna hurt. He doesn't make judgments like that about the moral, you know, life of the gazelle and which one he should kill. He just grabs the one that's in the back. It would be, it would be. As we go into our plays where people keep eating their children and killing their children. Um, so why, I guess we already answered this, why did the Athenians banish Aristides? Okay, he was powerful, but Matthew, you wanna to add to it? Yes. Yes, yes, all of the above. He was, he was vying for power with Themistocles. Themistocles did set him up, apparently. And then we get this lovely, famous story, we talked about this last year in your junior high class, of the, the illiterate man who wanted to write down Aristides' name, and, and he didn't know how, and he says, well, whose name do you want me to write down? He asks Aristides, and the man says Aristides. And he says to him, well, what has he done to you? Nothing. I just get so sick and tired of call, hearing him called the just. So Aristides writes his own name down and is ostracized. They call him back when the Persians come. You know, they call him back early. But, uh, but yeah, they, they got rid of the voice of calm and reason, and they went with the Mysticles. It just turned out to be they rolled dice, you know, and it was a good roll. <laughs> they rolled a good one. Um, how did his peacemaking nature help guide Greece in times of crisis? Did you see any instances of the fact that Aristides is calm and peacemaking and it helped guide them through crisis? Did you catch anything? Okay, that's one instance where he balanced out Themistocles' I don't even know, rashness with going in and saying, I need to tell you all, we are now surrounded by the Persian fleet, and the only, only chance we have is to fight. Uh, Plutarch tells us the story that when, um, it was the Battle of Plataea, I think, that next year, when Mardonius had stayed in Greece and he was gonna do a mop-up operation, which he died, it was not a good, he got mopped up, <laughs> not the Greeks. Um, they were arguing about which wing of the battle line the Athenians were going to be on, you know, who they were going to face. And the Athenians like, we should have this wing and we should have that wing. And they're arguing over it. They're arguing over it right before a battle. And Aristides, let me see if I can find it. Oh, um, to contend with the Tegeatans, they're the ones who want the wing said he, for noble descent and valor, the present time permits not. But this we say to you, O you Spartans and you the rest of the Greeks, that place neither takes away nor contributes courage. We shall endeavor by crediting and maintaining the post you assign to us to reflect no dishonor on our former performances. For we are come, not to differ with our friends, but to fight our enemies. It doesn't matter which side you give us whether you give us the place of honor or not. We're not here to fight with you, we're here to fight with them. Which is exactly what needed to be said at the time. How many, I mean, we could probably spend the rest of our class time, we won't, thinking of times when internal arguing brought down a cause, right? When arguing with each other made the, whatever cause it was or battle fail. 
Aristides was the smooth over guy. He was the calm voice of reason. And Themistocles was the wild, I've got an idea. It's awesome. Let's go burn the Greek fleet. Aristides is like, yeah, that's dishonorable. Don't do that. Don't do that. Do you, how are the Greeks going to see us after we do that? We're going to make a bunch of enemies is what we're going to do. But I propose to you that Athens needed them both. Sometimes we need statesmen, you know, that are willing to take a chance, that are on fire and energy and willing to be, you know, think outside the box, as we say. And sometimes we just need the cool voice of reason to say, we frequently need that. And I think Athens was very blessed to have both at the same time. They got rid of one briefly, but then they called him back. And they had them both at the same time, which is kind of cool. I wonder, so this is a, your thought question for the you know, day. Do we have both? Like in our society, do, do we have the voice of reason? Is, is one voice preponderating over the other? And how do we bring it back to that even keel? Yeah. Mm. We could probably, this could be the rest of our class time discussing current events, and, but we are not, it's not going to be. Um, <laughs> yeah, the media, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pronounce that too. I, I do not believe the media is the voice of reason. Oh, it's very powerful. All right. Okay, so we are going to stop and talk about murdering mothers now. Something, we're going to talk about something not so contentious, like murdering mothers. Because this, you know, getting into the media would be too tough. Let's just talk about murder, murdering family members. That's much easier. Yes. This is the problem. So how, now we're on our libation bearers. What are, what's a libation? It's a drink offering to the, a liquid offering to the gods. I'm sorry, she stole your, that's fine. She, it was her turn. Um, so in the Iliad and the Odyssey, we often see them taking the cup and pouring out a sip to the gods. This is a libation, all right? And so, uh, this is a way. I don't know. Uh, it's it's kind of nice. It's kind of like, it's, it's sort of, okay, I don't mean to equate Christianity and paganism, but it's sort of like they're giving thanks before the meal a little bit, but not exactly. So don't, Mrs. Ferguson is not a pagan. Don't be alarmed. Um, how does Electra? Electra is Clytemnestra and Agamemnon's still surviving daughter, the one that has not been murdered. Uh, how does she... Why is she going out to Agamemnon's tomb at the beginning of the play? Lay it on us. To bear gifts which were the libations in order to ward off the proud dead. Yes. And, and who sent her? Mother Earth. Okay, I don't think Mother Earth sent her to give the libations. They might be four, but it, you're half right. Clay Mother. <laughs> Mother sent them. Uh, Clytemnestra is having bad dreams. Gee, I don't know. I guess when you axe murder your husband in the tub, it leaves a mark on you. And, but in this case, I'm, I'm afraid her dreams are not bad conscience dreams so much as prophetic dreams. She's dreaming that she gave birth to a snake and it's going to come back and bite her. Gee. I wonder if we should get a psychologist to analyze this dream. You know, that you gave birth to a creature that's going to come back and... and <laughs> uh, so she's, she's having nightmares, and she thinks that Agamemnon is going to, I don't know, forgive her if she sends offerings to his tomb. Hey, sorry for killing you, by the way. Here's yeah. Have a drink of wine and just chill. Um, so Electra comes, the chorus, remember in 
Agamemnon, the chorus were the old men, the old men of the city who hadn't gone to Troy, the old men who lost their sons in the Trojan War. Now the chorus is the women, the serving women of the home, who are going out with Electra to offer these drink offerings at Agamemnon's tomb. And they show up. How does Electra know that Orestes has been there? I'm gonna, I'm gonna let Gabby do it. Yes. He has come home. Remember, he had been sent to live with friends. He was very young, you know, but he's grown up. And it was the custom. Uh, do you remember when Patroclus died? They all cut locks of hair and throw it on the pyre. You know, this was a thing. This was a Greek thing. Cut off your hair and throw it when, next time you go to a funeral. No. Oh, now I'm afraid. I'm afraid one of you will. Don't do it. And I could just see you, like, whipping them down the casket. I'm sorry. I am, I am wicked. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Sometimes I get an image in my head and I can't let it go. So Orestes has, yesterday I kept calling him Telemachus. Our Orestes has cut off a lock of his hair and put it on the tomb. Also, she sees a footprint. So she says, oh my gosh, look, this hair, it's, it's the same color as my hair. It's, it's Orestes. Oh, look, there's a footprint and it's, it's the same size as my foot. I think it's Orestes. Okay, so I got to tell you, because there's a joke that goes with this. No, no, hold on, wait for the joke, wait for the joke. So there, there, are, three, there are three playwrights that we're going to be reading, Aeschylus and Sophocles and Euripides, okay? We're gonna read plays by all three of them. Euripides is the youngest, and he was a little snarky sometimes. He, he liked to make fun of his predecessors. Like, it's like making a movie and putting Diggs, you know, previous versions or whatever of the same movie. Like if you remake a movie, but you give a little homage to the original, except making fun of it maybe. So that each of them wrote a play called Electra. Sophocles and Euripides, actually, Aeschylus did too. Um, and we actually have all three, which is amazing. All the versions of Electra. But in Euripides' Electra, he's the snarky one. In this, in this version, Electra has gotten, she's been married off to some poor schmuck living out in the country, and he's a nobody because they wanted to get rid of her. You know, and she's miserable. Anyway, and so this, but this scene comes. She comes to the tomb, and She's with, uh, I don't know, a serv an old servant man, something like that. And she sees the lock of hair and she picks it up and, and, and the servant says, oh, that hair looks just like yours. I wonder if your brother's here. And she says, are you kidding me? Like, do you, he's been gone for years. What makes you think his hair is the same color as my hair? What? People's hair changes. And then, and then they go to the footprint I, it's, it's hilarious. They go to the footprint and he says, oh my gosh, look, your foot is the same size. And she looks at him and says, hello, he's a guy. I'm paraphrasing. Don't you think his feet are bigger than mine by now? I'm not kidding you. This is in the play. It's hilarious. So it is right, I guess, to see a little bit of humor. Like, really? You... you you just know that's your brother because there's a lock of hair on the tomb. Yes. I thought you were going to say it's like, uh, <laughs> Electra, that's where you just stepped. <laughs> that would have been even better. No, I think that was where you just stepped. No, she really, she really gives him a talking to. It's like, what are you nuts? His foot is way bigger than mine. Anyway, I'm sorry. Now I feel like I've ruined this play just slightly by that humor. But Euripides is funny. Um, so Orestes has come home. Who has instructed Orestes to kill Clytemnestra and Aegisthus? Who? Mm, I haven't heard it yet. Who told Orestes, go home and kill your mom? No, that would be awesome if there was a ghost, but there was no ghost. Matthew. I put down either the chorus or Apollo. Apollo. Uh, 
Apollo. Okay, so let me find it. Let me find my flag. Okay. Orestes, this is line 272, something like that. Apollo will never fail me. No. His tremendous power, <clears throat> his oracle, charges me to see this through. I have been to see Apollo, and he told me to do this. <clears throat> I can still hear the god, a high voice ringing with winters of disaster, piercing the heart within me, warm and strong. Unless I hunt my father's murderers, cut them down in their own style. They destroyed my birthright. Gore them like a bull, he called, or pay their debt with your own life. One long career of grief. If you don't do it, I'm going to get you. That's what Apollo said. And then he goes on. I stopped. But he goes on and on about the horrible skin diseases and nasty stuff that's going to happen to him if he doesn't do it. So Orestes feels really confident, doesn't he? I have Apollo on my side. Apollo is going to come through for me. I am in the right. There is no doubt in my mind I am in the right. She killed my dad. And the gods see it, and the gods are acting, and I am their tool, their instrument. Make sense? So he's not, he's not uh, conflicted. So if you've ever read the play Hamlet, um, I need to do that summer Shakespeare next year. You know, I need to do it, because I don't have time for all these. But in the play Hamlet, Hamlet's dad has been poisoned by his uncle. And his uncle has taken over the throne and married his mother. Not his uncle's mother, Hamlet's mother. Ma ma married Hamlet's mother, oh, not his own mother. No, okay, no, no. That's really weird. <laughs> That's going to be the next play we're going to read after the Eumenides. No, never mind. Um, <laughs> back to the future. Uh, but Hamlet can't screw up his courage to do it for much of the play because <clears throat> this is his uncle. And he says... He sees a ghost of his dad, and the ghost of his dad says, kill him. He, he, he murdered me. I'm telling you, he murdered me, and you're the instrument of vengeance. But Hamlet's walking around, because this is a Christian world Hamlet's in. It's like, but, but sometimes Satan dresses up, and he tempts us to things, and maybe that's not really my father's spirit. Maybe it's the devil, and he's trying to get me to do something terrible, and, and I don't know, should I do it? Orestes doesn't feel any of this. Orestes is, Apollo says, do it, I'm doing it. Yeah. When, uh, when someone or something tells you to commit a sin, you know it. Yes, this is a good point. But, you know, and that's when our definition, the common topic of definition, is this a crime? Is this a sin for Orestes? You see, he's not seeing it that way. He's seeing it as justice. That justice is demanded. Um, so let me, before we go on to the next thing, I want to read a couple of things that the chorus says, okay? Um, I'm on, on line three, between 315 and 320. Um, it's, it, if your book looks exactly like mine, it's on page 192, but I don't know. Um, okay, okay. Um, Word for word, curse for curse, be born now, justice thunders, hungry for retribution. Stroke for bloody stroke be paid. The one who acts must suffer. Three generations strong, the word resounds. What word? The word that says the one who acts must suffer. Three generations. It depends on how you count the generations, but we have Pelops, like great great grandpa, who decided to kick it, cook his children and feed them to the gods. No, no, or was it Pelops who got cooked? I can't remember. Anyway, not. I think it's Pelops who got cooked, and his dad cooked him. So, so. Not all, just select kids. Well, in the case of Pelops, they, the gods said, whoa, I think this is a kid. Yeah, but not before one of them had eaten his shoulder. 
So they had to give him an ivory shoulder, like they put him back together again and brought him back to life, but he had a fake shoulder, like he had a bionic shoulder. So then we have Atreus and Thyestes, Agamemnon's parents, who cooks Thyestes' children and feeds them to him. Then we have Clytemnestra. I mean, let's not even get into sacrificing Iphigenia. Then we have Clytemnestra killing Agamemnon. Do you see we have a generational problem? It depends on how you count the three and which event you count, but we have a generational problem. This is why they call it the curse of the house of Atreus. All right, we have a generational problem. And the chorus says, this is what keeps happening. But the question is, when Orestes does this, will it all be over? Because remember when Clytemnestra, she stood up there and she said, just a second, when she said, I look like Agamemnon's wife, but I'm not. I'm really the avenging fury of the house, and I'm putting an end to all of this bloodshed, and all of this curse is done now. Uh, no. no. There's so she was wrong. How do we know this is the end? Okay, say what you wanted to say. But that is a good question. I'm, if you re learn nothing this year, just remember. No, I'm not, not that I was worried that anybody was going to do it, yes. How do we know that it's going to be done? Yes. See, Gabby makes a good point. If I show up, because as far as we know, no god came to Clytemnestra and said, kill your husband. He's a dirty, rotten scoundrel, kill him. Like, she just did it. But Apollo has told Orestes, you are the instrument of vengeance. Go do it. Go do it. But no, no witnesses. I don't know, I hate to say it that way. You know, it's just Orestes' word that he understands that Apollo has told him to do this. So I'm going to do it. And presumably, this will now put an end to the generations of curse on this house. Um, let's see where we are. Um, so I, I printed this excerpt in your reading guide. This is the chorus talking. It is the law. When the blood of slaughter wets the ground, it wants more blood. Slaughter cries for the fury of those long dead to bring destruction on destruction, churning in its wake. What law of nature, suppose, I put law of nature in quotes here. What law do you think the chorus is talking about? Okay, a law of justice, vengeance, retribution, blood wants more blood, right? So we have, you know, we read, um, those of you who read Huckleberry Finn with me, no, oh, that was my, oh shoot, that was my Wednesday, Tuesday kids read Huckleberry Finn last year. Well, if you've read Huckleberry Finn, you know, there's a Hatfield and McCoy sort of situation in Huckleberry Finn where there's generations of fighting and the blood just always wants more blood. You killed my uncle, so I kill your cousin, so you kill my brother, so I kill your nephew, so... You know, these feuds that go back and forth to the point where you're not even sure where they came from. So I'm gonna kill you, because you killed my dad, and you cooked my, you cooked my brothers, <laughs> So I'm gonna steal your wife and kill you. <laughs> and it goes on and on and on, doesn't it? Um, it's, it's sort of this never ending cycle, but hopefully, fingers crossed, right? When Apollo tells you to go clean it up, it's gonna be cleaned up. Um, uh, let me read this. Listen to what the chorus says here. Oh, the torment, bred in the race, the grinding scream of death, and the stroke that hits the vein, the hemorrhage that none can staunch, the grief, the curse no man can bear. There is a curse on this house, and none of them seem to be able to bear it. Now, because you're going to have to watch my last one on video and not talk about it. I'm going to give you a sneak preview. There is a curse. 
there is a curse on the world, isn't there? And the curse just is self-perpetuating. And until someone comes from outside, until someone came from outside to take the curse, it just never was going to end, was it? Keep that in mind, okay? When you read, when you read the last play, all right? I don't want to, I don't want to ruin the last play for you. But keep in mind. So we ask, well, why would Christians want to read anything like this? Ooh. Because remember we talked about the pagans know things. They know enough to know that they don't know, if that makes sense. They know, G.K. Chesterton says, sometimes we remember that we've forgotten who we are. All right? The pagans knew. There's no way out of this. There's a curse, and there's, there doesn't seem to be. How do we get out of this? What's the way out? Orestes thinks he's found the way out, though. Okay? Um, hang on. I've got, I see our times are wasting. Um, they say this. And you, who haunt the vaults where the gold glows in the darkness, hear us now, good spirits of the house. I'm talking to the spirits of the house of Atreus. Conspire with us. Come and wash old works of blood in the fresh-drawn blood of justice. Let the gray retainer murder breed no more. Please, please, we need it to stop. So, Orestes has a friend. He has his buddy Pylades, who you notice doesn't say anything. It's because we still have the whole, we only have two actors on stage, two speaking actors. And sometimes they would just put a, a non-speaking actor on stage. Because they just, like, oh, we couldn't have three people talking at one time. That would just be over the top. That would be over the edge. So he just stands there. Our friend Euripides, who makes fun of things, also makes fun of that a little bit uh, in his plays. Also, a playwright named Aristophanes, who wrote comedies, rips it really good. But, but Pylades and Orestes have a plan. We're going to pretend that Orestes is dead, and I'm bringing the message. I'm going to get myself in the house, and we're doing it. So they kill, Aegis, they kill Clytemnestra. No, I'm sorry. They kill Aegisthus first. They call Aegisthus to come. And they kill him. And a servant, of course, this creates a big turmoil in the house. And the servant women are running around. And one of them says, the dead are cutting down the quick, I tell you. Now, just as a note, maybe you know this, maybe you don't. Quick doesn't mean fast here. Quick means alive. Quick, these, the quick and the dead. Um, that used to be how, and it still is how some people, when they say the Nicene Creed or the Apostles' Creed, and he will come again in glory to judge the quick and the dead. It means the living and the dead. What the, it does not mean, they're, they're, peop, alive people are faster than dead people. I really can't, but I don't think that's, I think it's just a coincidence that quick is used in both situations. Um, so the servant runs in and says, the living are killing, the dead are killing the living. Now, on the surface, what do you think she means? What? Mm, it's not, not zombies, not ghosts. Orestes was supposed to be dead. They brought a message. Orestes is dead, and now Orestes is there killing people. But on another level, the, the dead are killing the living. Think of all the dead. Agamemnon. All those cooked children of multiple generations. Less than they're dead. Because, um, this, you think um, that for those who suffered that loss, that lost them, like Alexa and Orestes, they mm. lost them, they lost their lives. Mm -hmm. Yes. So Electra could also be one of the dead. That's very, that's very interesting. I like that. Yeah, Kyle. Exactly. 
Exactly. And, and, and the people doing the killing are just the tools of vengeance, but it's the dead doing the killing. And we have multiple generations. Iphigenia. See? The, the dead are killing the living. So he finally confronts his mom. And the final question I asked you was, what does Clytemnestra threaten him with? And go ahead, Matthew. The hounds, of a mother's the hounds of a mother's curse. And we don't really know exactly what that means initially. There's a curse. But you know what? It's not totally made up because in the Greek world there is a curse. There is a curse on killing your family members, your parents particularly killing your parents is just a bad deal all around. And the Furies will come for you. They will drive you to insanity and death and haunt your every step if you do this. So she's invoking, she's invoking Furies. What did you say, you, Carl? What? Medusa. Medusa. Um, she, the chorus is talking here, and they say, <clears throat> time brings all to birth. Soon time will stride through the gates with blessings. Soon there will be blessings on this house. I know it. Once the hearth burns off corruption, once the house drives off the Furies. But at the end of the play, much to Orestes and our dismay, Orestes sees them, and they are apparently hideous. There, you're going to meet these furies again at the beginning of the next play, and there is a story that women fainted in the theater. They were so hideous. Aeschylus is the first one to do the whole furies with snake hair, the whole Gorgon snake hair thing. And Orestes is, yay, it's over. And he says, no, no, women look like gorgons, shrouded in black, their heads wreathed swarming serpents. I cannot stay, I must move on. And of course, the leader of the chorus doesn't see anything and says, what, what's your problem? No, you're just dreaming. You're, you're having hallucination or something. You're just, it's been a very emotional day for you. You know, you just killed your mom. Um, no dreams, these torments, not to me. They're clear, real, the hounds of mother's hate. And the leader of the chorus says, the blood's still wet on your hands. It puts a kind of frenzy on you. God, Apollo, here they come, thick and fast, their eyes dripping hate. You can't see them. I can. They drive me on. I must move on. And so he runs off. And the chorus ends by saying, here once more, for the third time, the tempest in the race has struck the house of kings and run its course. First the children eaten cause of all our pain, the curse, and next the kingly man's ordeal, the bath where the proud commander, lord of Achaea's armies, lost his life, and now a third has come. But who? A third like saving Zeus? Or should we call him death? We thought Orestes was the savior. We thought Apollo was the savior. Where will it end? Where will it sink to sleep and rest this murderous hate, this fury? Apollo didn't rescue us. Orestes didn't rescue us. Now he's run off to who knows where. You'll find out in the next play. How do we get out of this cycle? That's what the next play is about. I want you to read the Eumenides. The Eumenides means the kindly ones. And it's the story of how the Furies are going to become the Eumenides. The kindly ones, all right? It's, it's, it's going to strike you as a very weird play. It is a weird play, because Orestes is going to take his ca case to court. And Athena is going to be the presiding judge. He told me to do it. She killed my mother. Or she killed my father, sorry. And we're going to take it to court. All right? I want you to also read Plutarch's Life of Chimon. He's, one, he's a guy in Athens we haven't talked much about. He got mentioned in the life of Themistocles, I think, as another rival for Themistocles' glory. So you will hear about that on the video next week. I also want you to begin a paper. You, this is the old, oldie but a goodie, 
Should Orestes have killed his mother? Should Orestes have killed his mother? And this week, all I'm asking my other students to do is invention. So you know, you know how to do this. I know you do. Yes, he should have. No, he shouldn't have. And ask yourself as many questions as possible to come up with reasons for and against. In the back of your book, page 121, I think, you have the common topics. So ask yourself things like, define it. Is it murder or is it justice? Is it vengeance or is it just, is it just anger? What is this thing he's doing? Compare it. What, what happened before this? That's important, right? What happened before? What might happen after? Both ways. What if he doesn't do it? What might happen? Well, Apollo told him he was going to mess him up. That might have happened. Who knows what would have happened to the town if, if Clytemnestra and he just this kept being the rulers. So think about, what's hap think about what's happening at other times. Think about Orestes growing up away from home and how that may have changed his psyche. All right? Testimony. Think about what other people in the play have to say about it. Think about what God has to say about it. Think about what anybody else that you can think of has to say about this issue, okay? So do that, and then use the template for arrangement to make an outline. It is also in the back of your book. You know how to do this. I mean, you've, you've done these, okay? But here's what I'd like you to do. Even though I will not see you, if anyone has any problem, because next week when you watch the video, I'll say, okay, now go ahead and write. Here's your elocution elements that I want you to put in it, and then you can work on it. If you have any questions, call me, email me, or call me. Just call me, and I will answer your question right away. Leave a message on my answering machine, I'll call you back. If you email me, I'll try to get back to you as soon as possible, okay? I don't mind at all. I would rather take the time to just one-on-one -on -one if you're saying, I, I can't come up with reasons for this. Okay, let's talk about it on the phone. Let's, let's chat over it. I'm very willing to do that. I'm not going anywhere for Christmas, all right? Um, th so that's what we're going to work on. So this week, your goal is to do the invention, get some lists, generate some ideas, and arrange it in an outline. Think of three main supports and then three sub-supports and then a couple of things that the other side might say that you're going to say, uh, that's why you're wrong. All right? Are we good? All right? If anybody has any problem with that, you call me, and then I will see you via video. The comments are turned on, you know. You guys could get a little conversation going about what you think about the third play. And, and then I will give you your assignment for writing, okay? Have a lovely Christmas. Thank you.